Well, hello and welcome to episode number 22 of the Practical EdTech Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Byrne. It is December 6, 2019, getting down towards the end of the year. Speaking of the end of the year, one of the things that I wrote about on my EdTech Fitness blog this week was the idea that your New Year's resolution can start whenever you want it to start. You don't have to wait until January 1st to start your New Year's resolution. In fact, the data says you might be better off starting your New Year's resolution not at New Year's. To be more successful if you don't do it at New Year's. Really interesting thought. And uh, I actually applied that to my own life this time last year. I realized I was 40 and I was approaching 40 pounds heavier than I wanted to be. And so I started getting back on my exercise bike just 20 minutes a day at first. And then over the year, I built up to a lot more than that. But just did it every day or almost every day. I've averaged 5.95 workouts for the year. 5.95 a week for the year. And I'm at 41 in better shape than I was at 36. So that's cool. Uh, not here to brag, just to tell you, just to give you some motivation that, hey, you can do it. I did it. You can do it. I've got two toddlers. I've got a full-time job. I do this too. It's uh, it's possible to do it if you can make the time and uh, really commit to it. But, you know, start that New Year's resolution right now. All right. Uh, you got a little EdTech Fitness thing I want to point out. And if you're watching the video of this, you'll see I've got my watch on. One of the things I learned in about June of this year was about heart rate training and, uh, you know, really took advantage of that. And I wrote a blog post about that uh, the week of Thanksgiving about heart rate training and how I was able to use my Garmin fitness watch to uh, really take advantage of that. And it turns out you don't have to uh, bust your butt quite as hard in every single workout as you think, as you might think you do. All right. So... Some other news and notes from the world of EdTech. Next week is Computer Science Education Week. I don't know who makes up, who decides that that's the week. But anyway, Computer Science Education Week is next week. And of course, Hour of Code is the big star, if you will, of Computer Science Education Week. Pretty much every company in the world that offers some kind of EdTech product is offering something along for Hour of Code or trying to capitalize on it and their marketing. You know, Microsoft is hosting, you know, tons of events. They have 400 free events happening in stores around the world. Uh, go to Microsoft.com and look at their store locations for events. Uh, Minecraft has some Hour of Code lessons. You can check that out at education.minecraft.net and you'll find Hour of Code lessons that are free. Tinker, T-Y-N-K-E-R, Tinker, Tinker with a Y, uh, has a ton of Hour of Code lessons and activities from really basic stuff that you can truly do in an hour to some complex stuff that's going to take you much more than an hour. Yeah. And of course, Hour of Code itself has all kinds of resources. Go to hourofcode.com, uh, hourofcode.com slash US if you're in the United States, and you'll find tons of resources there. So check those out. But I'm going to put in a pitch for one of my favorite things for elementary school and middle school, and that is Scratch. Scratch and Scratch Junior. Scratch Junior is a version for early elementary school, and Scratch is appropriate for upper elementary and middle school. Uh, great ways to introduce kids to programming in a very visual format. And, you know, MIT has great resources about it. Uh, there's a couple of books. If you look at the show notes for today's podcast, I've li linked up a couple of little activity books in there. If you want to, if you're the book type, uh, who, you know, someone who likes to read a book or have a book while you're trying things out, there's some great books I've listed there. Uh, and I'll also give a, a plug for GlideApps.com. They don't, they're not offering anything specific to Hour of Code or Computer Science Education Week, but GlideApps.com is great if you want to take your high school students and have them quickly create a mobile app or a mobile-friendly app, mobile-friendly website uh, that looks like an app using just a Google spreadsheet. 
I've got a tutorial on how to use Glide apps on my uh, YouTube channel. Also have it on Pre-Tech for Teachers. Um, but it's a, you, know, you can quickly get students feeling like they're accomplishing something, making an app uh, using GlideApps.com. So check that out. All right. Oh, so some things that are not computer science related. Uh, Google Sites has a bunch of new updates coming, uh, some of which are long overdue, like revision and version history is going to be available in the new version, the new, the current version of Google Sites, the classic version, the old version, which is going away. Uh, they keep pushing back the deadline for when that's going away, by the way. Uh, but the current version, what's called the new version of Google Sites, is finally going to have version and revision history. And another neat little thing that's coming to Google Sites is the option to review changes before they go live on your site. Now, if you're working by yourself, you're the only editor of the site, it doesn't matter. But if you're collaboratively working on a site, so if you've got yourself and three of your students, or you've got four students working on it in groups, they can now review the changes that someone else makes before those changes are published. So if there's a mistake, someone writes something incorrect or inappropriate, you can catch it before it goes live. So finally have that feature available in the new version of Google Sites. Now those features are going to be rolling out right now, December 6th, through the next, uh, through the next month or so. So depending on your domain, uh, you may not see it immediately, but you'll see it in the next month or so. You'll see it by the end of January. Uh, switching up to some Microsoft news, uh, Flipgrid, which is owned by Microsoft, if you didn't know. Uh, Flipgrid announced a bunch of updates earlier this week on December 2nd, so four days ago. Uh, and those include recording video without using audio. So just have your face on there or just have your screen up there. Uh, you can change the playback speed of the videos. Could be useful, you know, if you want to go back and catch something that a student said or... You know, fast forward through something, great for that. Uh, video sorting, so you can you know, sort through your videos a little more quickly, rearrange the order in which they appear, that sort of stuff. And finally, Immersive Reader is now available in the feedback section. So previously, Immersive Reader was there to uh, for the directions, but now it's available for feedback as well. You can find all the information about those updates at blog.flipgrid.com. So again, blog.flipgrid.com. You can get all the feedback or all the information about those Flipgrid updates. Right. Another little uh, Windows, uh, not Windows, but uh, Microsoft update. Text-to-speech is finally rolling out for Mac users using Word. Or the Word version, the Mac version of Word is finally going to have text-to-speech. Long overdue, finally going to have that. And the last news and notes I want to share with you, the Practical EdTech Creativity Conference is next week. I've got seven great presenters lined up for this, including my friend Tony Vincent, who uh, graciously agreed to uh, be a part of it, uh, and many others. Uh, so it's going to be a great event. It's free, completely free, no strings attached. The only string being you've got to put in your email address and your name. That's the only string. Uh, <laughs> but you can check that out at practicaledtech.com and sign up. It's free. You'll be registered for all the sessions. Um, yeah. So it's going to be awesome. Check it out. Uh, com again, completely free. Now, speaking of things that aren't free, Thank you to everyone who supported Practical Ed Tech and Free Tech for Teachers last week by taking advantage of the uh, on-demand webinar sale package that I was having. A bunch of you stepped up and purchased those, so thank you so much. Uh, helps me keep all of this going. Uh, it's not my full-time job. It helps me keep it all going. So thank you so much for that, everyone. Speaking of my full-time job, reflections from my classroom this week. My week was awesome. 
Uh, it started out not so awesome, I gotta say. But it ended awesome. It started out not so awesome. Uh, I was supposed to... Well, I won't go into the details. My week started out rough, ended on a high note. So let's let's just say that. All right, it was a great week. Uh, I had an observation done by my director on Thursday. So yesterday morning, my director came in and did an observation while I was teaching my freshman class, my freshman intro to computer science uh, course, uh, computer science principles. It's the course. Uh, and I've got a, uh, I've got 12 freshman boys and one junior, uh, and they are a busy group. Uh, shall we say they're, they're, well, they're freshman boys and they move around a lot and they wiggle a lot and they, you know, and a lot of them, it's the only place in school where they have success in school, where they feel like they're experts, where they feel like they're, you know, on top of things and they're really doing well. So my, my director was really, really happy to see that. And he also gave me some great tips on how to manage, uh, you know, some great tips on, you know, classroom management with uh, my very energetic freshmen. I feel like, you know, I've been out of the classroom for uh, a lot of years. I've been out of the classroom on a, I haven't been in a classroom with freshmen on a full-time basis in a long time. Uh, and so I, I kind of, I told him beforehand, I said, you know, I feel like I'm a little bit rusty on some of the classroom management with, uh, with excited freshmen. He gave me any tips and he gave me some good ideas. So, uh, but, uh, but otherwise, you know, my freshmen were awesome. I had a, one of my freshman students had a major breakthrough. Uh, he's a student who, uh, has, uh, historically not done well in school, uh, not a lot of confidence. And he had a major breakthrough, got his Android app working. He's been using the MIT app inventor, uh, for six, eight, nine weeks. It's been a long time now. Uh, and it finally, the app finally worked and it was awesome to see the lights go on in his eyes. I was like, holy crap, I can do this. Uh, it was amazing. He was totally psyched and he wasn't, he's not, uh, if you were to, you know, line up all of my students, be like, that's a computer science student. He would be the one who is not like the others in terms of, you know, who you think of when you think of computer science students. So it was totally awesome to see that. Uh, some other cool things from my classroom. I tweeted a picture this afternoon of a sign that I had to put up in my on my classroom closet for my sophomores. Uh, and this sign was basically just a reminder to my students to check with me and or Mr. Billings, uh, a teacher who comes in and helps me sometimes, uh, and exhaust all possible repair options before grabbing new parts. A lot of my sophomores are like, oh, it doesn't work. It must be that it needs a new X, Y, or Z. And oftentimes, uh, if they just slowed down a little bit, they'd find that they can troubleshoot without having to put in new parts. Uh, they can repair things without having to put in new parts. So uh, just a little reminder there. Uh, and the other thing I tweeted a picture of this week is a cool old laptop that one of my kids, uh, one of my seniors found in the back closet of uh, <laughs> back closet of the closet, basically. Uh, it's an old 1994 vintage compact 425 laptop, original MSRP, $2,400, uh, in today's money, that's like $4,200 if you do the, uh, inflation calculation. Just a really cool old machine and it actually works. We fired it up we found a Windows 3.1 floppy disk, uh, and fired it up and it works uh and it was really cool to see to go down that little uh memory lane of computer science if you will all right so if you don't follow me on twitter it's twitter.com slash rm burn uh, i also put those pictures on instagram if you want to see them as well all right oh my instagram is also instagram.com slash rm burn i'm rm burn everywhere even on facebook which i'm hardly on but i'm on facebook all right, so some questions from readers and listeners and viewers like you. Number one. Hi, Richard. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I'm almost a neighbor in central New Hampshire with two kids at UMaine Orno, so I'm really almost a neighbor. Uh, any suggestions on polling apps for mobile devices? As always, thank you, Kim. So, uh... I suggested a couple of things to Kim. I could have gone with my standard of using 
you know, a Google Forms, which is mobile friendly or poll everywhere. And I did say poll everywhere, you know, is a, you know, is a good option, but it's not a, you know, it's not necessarily the newest or latest or coolest thing out there. So what I recommended to Kim were two other things I'm kind of digging right now. One is a tool called Acquainted. Uh, it's a, a polling slash chatbot tool. You'll find it at getacquainted.co. Uh, it lets you uh, program in responses to people's responses to a poll. So it looks like you're interacting with their poll and with their responses in real time. It's kind of a neat tool. Uh, really, really like it. So uh, check it out at getacquainted.co. And it, again, it's designed to be used on mobile tools. The other one I mentioned is a tool that I've uh, recently published a video about and really, really like for creating polls that go inside of your existing Google Slides. And that's called Slido. Find it at sli.do slido and it lets you add um, quiz questions or poll questions directly into your google slides and students can respond using a code that they enter on their mobile devices so really cool uh, a couple of really cool options there that i told kim about All right. question number two came from a reader named melissa who says richard I'm interviewing for a technology integration specialist. I'm teaching about infographics and Google Forms. What would be better to demo? Infographics using PictoChart or Google Forms? Love your website and Facebook posts. Well, thank you, Melissa. So my suggestion for Melissa, if it was me and I was interviewing for a technology integration job, uh, now I don't have any background information on the school district or where she's interviewing, but if it was me and I was interviewing and I just went into it cold, I would be more inclined to do demos related to Google Forms and Google Sheets than I would be of uh, an infographic tool. And here's why, because Google Forms and Google Sheets, you can use across the board and apply to lots of situations. Uh, not that you couldn't do that with PictoChart, but if you're going to a school or a school district that's really into data and data analysis, Google Forms and Google Sheets is going to be great for that because you can really demo that to uh, to teachers, but also demo it to administrators and show them some of the things they can do with data and data analysis. Uh, yeah, Google Forms, I think, is just a more flexible tool that you can use in almost any setting. Whereas PictoChart, you might find yourself having to try to sell people on it a little bit more than you would Google Forms. So. That's my inclination, but again, I have no background information on what your what the district you're look, going to is looking for or what their job posting said. But you know, based on that question, I would go with Google Forms. All right. Uh, question came from Sam, uh, and I will tell readers who are wondering. Uh, Sam is a woman, short for Samantha, uh, and I only know that from the little profile icon, uh, not from uh, you know, not from like asking, but just judging by the profile icon. Anyway, uh, question from Sam. Do you have any Twitter chats that you recommend time topics? Uh, so my suggestion, check out Jerry Blumengarten's Cyberry Man website. He keeps a detailed list of all manner of Twitter chats, when they are, what the topics are, uh, and even where archives of them are. So uh, Cyberry Man you find him at Cyberry Man. Uh, hold on. You find him at Cyberry Man. He's Cyberry Man on Twitter, um, and he'll uh, he has great great lists there. Uh, Cyber Jerry Blumengarten, Cyberry Man on Twitter. He's got great lists. Keeps track of all of that stuff. Uh, you know, personally, I don't spend much of any time in twitter chats these days haven't for years actually it's probably been seven or eight years since i've been active in any particular twitter chat and that's and i've talked about this before that's just m me and my feeling about social media and that like i feel like sometimes uh it becomes a competition to try to get a word in edgewise as opposed to trying to really you know have a good constructive 
a longer dialogue. I just feel like, you know, Twitter, you know, even with 280 characters now or 288 characters, 280 characters, uh, it, it just feels like it just feels too disjointed to me. It feels like competition to get a word in edgewise. And so for me, uh, it doesn't do it for me anymore. Uh, you know, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, it did, but uh, that's just me right now. And again, if you like if you like Twitter chats, by all means, you know, I'm not saying don't do them. I know they're great for a lot of people. It's just my personality it doesn't really fit with my personality and the way that I like to talk or interact with people. So that's that's me. All right. Last question I have here came from Tyler. Uh, Tyler asked, do you have any suggestions for some tech, interesting tech projects? Oh, interesting. Sorry. Do you have any suggestions for some interesting tech projects that I can do with my middle school social studies before the Christmas break? I've got a group that's very busy and needs something to do if we're going to make it to break. Uh, I love the way that you've, uh, phrased that Tyler. I love the way that Tyler phrased that. Uh, I've been there. Uh, I've, I've been, I've been there. You've got a group of kids that are, you know, busy or excited or, you know, just a wiggly group, uh, and you need, you need to keep them engaged. So I, I don't know what you have for technology in your classroom, Tyler, but a couple of things that I might look at is doing something with green screens, um, and letting kids, you know, act out roles of historical characters in front of a green screen. Uh, you can get a cheap green screen, go down to your Walmart, get a $15 queen size green bed sheet, use that as your green screen and, uh, you know, use an iPad or your phone or even just the webcam built into your laptop, capture that footage in front of the green screen and then drop it into iMovie or Wii video and have kids make green screen videos about historical characters, you know, put them into historical settings. That's the first thing that comes to mind for me. You, know, you can have kids try to make podcasts. You know, like kids try to make podcasts or do a live action, do a live action video show where they're doing some, uh, you know, they're doing news reports or current events reports, current events commentary. You know, I would do something like I would do something in, in that regard, but really, I would get really excited about doing doing green screen uh, if you have the resources in front of you. If you're a Mac user or an iPad user, you can do this in iMovie really easily. Uh, if you're a Chromebook user or a Windows user, Wii Video makes it really easy to do green screens as well. My YouTube channel has some, has some tutorials on it. Uh, I also have a whole um, webinar on demand that you can watch about it as well. So that's where, that's where I would go. That would probably take you to the end of the uh, end of your December until Christmas break. So that's what I do. That's what I do. That's what I try. All right. So again, I'll remind you about the Practical Ed Tech Creativity Conference coming up next week. Check it out, practicaledtech.com. It's featured on the homepage right now. Sign up. It's free to sign up and join us. It's going to be a great time. And if you have any questions for me, as always, feel free to send me an email. Richard at burn.media is my email address. And I'm always, always happy to get questions from readers, listeners, and viewers like you. Have a great weekend, everyone. I'm going to ride my bike.